We have a two-in-one episode for you today. First, a Chicago story of giving, which I think fits in well with the upcoming holidays. And then we're going to talk with Amanda Scatis, founder of Chicago Detours, which pre conducted walking and bus tours of Chicago landmarks and traditions. They now conduct tours via Zoom. Chicago Detours is hosting the Virtual Holiday Stories Happy Hour this month. It's a fun and interactive dive into the hidden histories behind some of Chicago's most beloved traditions. As always, I'm Tommy Henry, and this is the Chicago History Podcast. A week ago Saturday, on November 28th, 2020, it was reported that a gold coin was dropped into a Salvation Army bucket in suburban Bartlett, Illinois, and a gold bar was dropped into a Salvation Army bucket in Mundelein, Illinois, some 30 miles away. With a combined value of about $3,700, that's $3,700 in today's money, a little joke for longtime listeners. That's a nice boost for the Salvation Army's fundraising efforts, one that I hope continues. We are not going to talk about those gold coins today. Instead, we're going to talk about a Chicago charity effort that has its beginnings going back 110 years. On December 10th, 1909, the Chicago Tribune published a letter with the headline To the Good Fellows of Chicago, in part. The letter reads, Last Christmas and New Year's Eve, you and I went out for a good time and spent from $10 to $200. Last Christmas morning, over 5,000 children awoke to an empty stocking, the bitter pain of disappointment that Santa Claus had forgotten them. Perhaps it wasn't our fault. We had provided for our own. We had also reflected in a passing way on those less fortunate than our own, but they seemed far off and we didn't know how to find them. Perhaps in the 101 things we had to do, some of us didn't think of that heart sorrow of the child over the empty stocking. The letter went on to ask for people to step up anonymously and send a letter to Santa Claus, care of the Trib, saying they would supply presents to those children in need. The Tribune would send back a list of children's names, addresses, age, and gender to the letter sender, and that sponsor would be responsible for picking up presents and delivering them to the children. I'll sidestep all of the reasons why this wouldn't work today. The letter was signed, Good Fellow. According to the story, the Tribune had investigated the Good Fellow and gave their blessing. The Good Fellow had, in his time, taken care of 15 to 20 children per year on his own, and would help assemble the list of children through teachers and various organizations in, quote, poverty-stricken districts, end quote. The next day, the Chicago Tribune reported people had stepped up, sending in letters pledging to help 2,000 children. Two days later, on December 13, 1909, that number had grown to 7,610. Three days after that, it had nearly doubled to 14,000. By Christmas Day, 1909, it was reported 3,000 good fellows, which, yes, included women, made 15,000 children in Chicago happy by delivering gifts. The program continued the following year, and in February of 1911, local movie studio SNA Film Manufacturing Company announced they were making a movie about this charity effort. Chicago's Christmas charity movement, soon to be seen in all parts of the world through the agency of Kinetoscope. I haven't seen this film called A Goodfellow's Christmas Eve. I'm not even sure if copies exist, but from what I've read, it is a not-so-subtle rip-off of A Christmas Carol. The main character, Scrooge, sorry, Grouch, is a terrible miser who one day reads the newspaper, a Chicago Tribune, of course, about the exploits of the good fellows and throws it down in disgust. But after dreams of happy Christmases past, spoiler alert, he sees the error of his ways and becomes a good guy. Uh, Along the way, the good fellows help a fainting woman find a deserted baby and help a sick woman and some orphans. 
The film did open later that year, on December 15, 1911, and although early reports claimed, quote, copies of the original film will be distributed over half the civilized world, end quote, I do not know whether that was the case. The Goodfellas movement caught on around the city and created additional similarly named efforts in the book When to Stop the Cheering, the Black Press, the Black Community, and the Integration of Professional Baseball. Author Brian Carroll writes that in the 1920s, Chicago Defender newspaper publisher Robert Abbott founded the Chicago Defender Goodfellas Club, which allied Southside businessmen, including several gaming kings, to raise money for the needy, particularly at Christmas time. The Chicago Defender, by the way, is said to at one time have the highest circulation of any black-owned newspaper in the country. Most major cities in the United States develop their own Goodfellows efforts as well. When an assistant city attorney named Edward Fitch died in 1928, the story of the unnamed originator of the Goodfellows efforts started to come out. Fitch had been at a holiday party with friends and noticed the amount of money being spent. He stopped by the Tribune newspaper offices at 1.30 a.m. and met James Keeley, the managing editor. He told Keeley about the party and explained, quote, On my way home, I began to think that good fellows might want to spend their money in a better way, end quote. Fitch and Keeley worked for about three hours, getting the message just right for print in the newspaper. A few other notable Goodfellows stories. In December of 1941, 500 girls and boys from the choruses of five Chicago high schools participated in the sixth annual Chicago High School Goodfellow Carol Sing in front of a 40-foot Christmas tree. In a story in the December 26, 1959 Chicago Tribune, representatives from 20 charitable institutions expressed their appreciation for the Chicago Tribune Charities Goodfellow Campaign. 5,000 Goodfellows helped 6,000 children in the care of these charitable institutions with nearly 14,000 toys and other gifts. By the late 60s, mentions of the Goodfellows began to slow, and by the early 70s were all but non-existent. I reached out to Elise De Los Santos, a content editor for the Chicago Tribune, who wrote a piece about the Goodfellows last year, and we both found the same dead end, although agreed it is likely the Goodfellows program was absorbed into the Chicago Tribune charities, which still operates today. In July of 2010, my guest today launched Chicago Detours in order to share the architecture, history, and culture of Chicago through guided tours for tourists and for locals. Since then, Amanda Scatiz and Chicago Detours has had more than 40,000 walking and bus tour guests on various outings. With the great pause of 2020 and Chicago stay-at-home orders, Scatiz and Chicago Detours had to shift their presentation Uh, developing virtual events to engage those at home in front of a screen. It must be working, according to their website, chicagodetours.com. Chicago Detours has had 26,000-plus virtual tour guests. Chicago Detours' latest offering is the Virtual Holiday Stories Happy Hour, which incorporates hidden histories behind some of Chicago's most beloved holiday traditions. Amanda, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. As a history fan, um, I appreciate the heck out of people who are so into history, especially Chicago history, obviously. Uh, Share a little bit of your background for those uh, unfamiliar with with you and Chicago Detours. Yeah, so um, our team, everyone has background in history, uh, architecture, education, Everyone's got background as educators, so we're really enthusiastic about sharing our knowledge. Our angle as a tour company and now virtual events company has always been that we bring people to explore stories in places locals don't know. So what we like to do is share perspectives on either the most famous sites 
or point out the things that you might normally just walk right by and not even imagine that there would be a, an incredible story to. So to create our content, we go digging through all kinds of old books, newspapers, magazines, the archives, just as you do, and, uh, and, and looking at old photographs and film to really come up with an angle that doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about uh, the, the tour and the events and, and uh, all that goes with it. Sure. So we, uh, we started out, um, we were doing all kinds of different virtual events and presentations. Um, and then around July, we uh, really honed in on a few of our most popular virtual events and really perfected them. And we did a ton of uh, creative brainstorming to make the events, uh, to make sure that our events were not lectures, but much more interactive for people. So we spent uh, months uh, testing out different kinds of games and creative challenges. And now we've been doing these for alumni groups, corporate groups, families, and especially for the holidays, we have our virtual holiday stories happy hour. And that one we are super excited about. Um, that is going to go through the history of Chicago holiday traditions, both the very famous ones and also the forgotten. And we um, have a bunch of fun, interactive ways uh, to make it into really an experience uh, to have. There's surprises and creative challenges in that and everything. Uh, I think it's so cool that your office is in the uh, Madadnock building. I always trip on that. Um, share with your guests, so share with our guests, a little bit about the history of that building if they're not familiar with it. Um, I actually went on one of your tours uh, a while back, and that was actually part of the tour. It was super cool. Um, but anyway, uh, share with why you, uh, a little bit about the history of the building and why you chose to set up your offices there. Oh, well, the Mananak building for many years was one of my favorites because so the Mananoc building is an early Chicago skyscraper, and I like to describe it as the dinosaur of skyscrapers because it was at the very beginning of when people were really trying to figure out how to build buildings taller, and they were experimenting with different structural ways of doing that. And uh, in most cases, a skyscraper got taller through the use of uh, stronger metal, uh, mostly steel. And with the Mananoc, it is actually the tallest office skyscraper that has ever been built purely out of masonry. So the thing has these massively thick walls at the bottom. They kind of taper up as you go up to make the building lighter. Um, but it uh, just being at the base of that building, it's kind of like, uh, it's the closest thing you're going to get to going to an Egyptian pyramid in the city of Chicago. It's got this uh, just monumental force to it. Um, and then on the inside, there has been a, uh, we did a special series of tours where we did them of specifically the Monadnock building and we did them for free, but we gave the um, gratuity donations 100% to Preservation Chicago because this building is an incredible example of historic preservation. It was really the one of the first office buildings in the country to undergo a historic restoration in the 1980s where people had Frankensteined all kinds of horrible updates to it over uh, the, you know, the years because the building originates from the um, 1890s. And people had, you know, made some floors look like the 1940s and the 1960s and all kinds of crazy stuff. And then in the 1980s, they really tried to bring the building back to its original beauty. And that involved uh, remaking the mosaic tile floors. It involved uh, making um, the glass. Uh, there's like this privacy glass on the uh, for all of the offices that uh, would allow the natural light from the outside to be able to reach into the hallway. Um, and it's just beautiful. You look at it and it looks like feathers. 
And just walking into that building is uh, an experience in itself. It's like taking a step back in time with original lighting fixtures and marble walls. So when we actually, uh, for many years, we were in a building that's called the Heartland Building. It's going to be where um, the uh, company uh, that did the Chicago Blue Book, old timers know what that is. Um, it was uh, Bennett Brothers. And that's at the corner of Wabash and Adams. We were in that building for a few years. And then a few years ago, the family that owned that building sold it to a developer to turn it into micro apartments. And we had to find a new office. And um, I was completely delighted to find that the Monadnock building was something that we would be able to do as a small business because a lot of the historic buildings downtown were designed with small offices versus when you get into the post-World War II era is when companies started getting bigger and so offices and space started getting bigger. And also just as a matter of scale, a lot of real estate companies don't wanna deal with tiny operations. So the Monadnock is a really awesome building for for small operations, there's lots of lawyers and therapists in there. Um, I mean, we'll see what happens post pandemic. Um, but um, that's, uh, that's how we ended up in the Monadnock building. Nearly nine months into the quarantine, people have gotten antsy, then kind of accepting, I think, and then now they seem to be getting a little antsy again. How do you keep your guests engaged uh, while using screens? And what do you think your guests find most engaging about your virtual events? So there are a lot of ways that we make the experiences interactive. Um, so uh, the most basic one is going to be the chat function. So when we're presenting, all of our events are live. And so we are watching that chat window and people can ask questions in real time and we will answer them. So that kind of gives you more of a feeling like you're, you're on, a, you know, on a tour and can actually engage with the tour guide probably more than you would normally because you wouldn't want to interrupt things and say, hey, Hey, I've got you know this question so we do that we also really love it when people just simply comment people will be like what that's so cool I never knew that um, and then we also have uh, designed a lot of different uh, games and for to give you an example so on our deep slice of Chicago food history tour which when groups uh, book that they can also get frozen deep dish pizza delivered anywhere in the country and people can prep that for the experience so they're having the Chicago food while we're doing that so that in itself is an aspect of it being interactive uh, but for that one if it's like a corporate team, we'll have people go into breakout rooms and after we've presented the history of Chicago food and they know a little bit more about it, we have them create their own, their new signature dish for Chicago. And we give them certain parameters and we tell them, okay, it's gotta be delicious and it's gotta reflect the cultures of Chicago and you need to come up with a name for it. And then we have everyone come back and we judge them and vote on them. Uh, we also have like, um, uh, for our boat tour, we have our virtual boat tour. We have boat tour bingo, which has, uh, your bingo card is full of, uh, historical, uh, items, architectural knowledge, uh, things that we actually see and talk about on the tour so that people are engaging with the content and checking off whenever we talk about a certain thing. And then whoever is the first to chat bingo, uh, is going to be the winner on that one. Um, for our virtual holiday stories, happy hour, that one, uh, is, it's, so fun. Um, we have a little bit of a holiday disco dance party for a quick break. And we also have people compete in de uh, decorating their backgrounds. And then most of all, the highlight of the experience is that we get the audience to actually participate in the storytelling. 
and they are characters of history and we give them a script and they can uh, create costumes either uh, for real from items in their home or uh, from a filter, like a Zoom filter. They can, um, for example, wear sunglasses or we've got little eight-year-old Greta. She can wear like a little bow and it is, it is so fun to see people kind of show off their acting performance skills and then they're, they really become part of the storytelling experience. Do you have anything else going on for the holidays we should know about? Yes. So for one, people can get a gift card uh, that people could choose to redeem for that virtual holiday stories happy hour or our badass women of Chicago history event that's coming up in March for Women's History Month. And then we've also printed a badass women journal for the badass woman in your life, the mothers, the sisters, the wives, the uh, mentors. And what we did is we had an artist create original artwork of women from Chicago history um, and give, and we have little bios about them and that's interspersed among blank pages so that someone else can write kind of an inspirational gift. Um, and that arose out of our Badass Women of Chicago History event that we were doing every March where we were, it was a live storytelling event. Because we find that, you know, if you ask someone about uh, men from Chicago history, they've got an endless list of people that they could give to you. And then when you ask about women, there's maybe two or three names that just come up over and over again. And there are so many women that have done absolutely incredible accomplishments over the years. And so this is our way of sharing that history. I, I love all that. I think that uh, having it be so interactive, certainly with everything going on, uh, sounds like it's a, it's a whole new avenue that I hope gets to continue on, you know, long after we're through this uh, dark period. Um, so, and I love the fact that uh, even being a history nerd, when I've uh, done your tours, I've actually learned a lot. I'm going to guess that you hear that a lot from people who say like, oh, I studied history. I know everything about Chicago. And they still walk away saying, I learned a lot. Yes, that is uh, part of what brings us the most joy is over the years, our signature tour has been the Loop Interior Architecture Walking Tour. And our favorite, I mean, at least my favorite would be when uh, locals would come because uh, someone who's on vacation already is expecting to be wowed and, you know, they're in Chicago and everything needs to, you know, is, is magnificently new. But someone who's a local, someone who worked in downtown Chicago for decades, they feel like it's familiar. And then to show them these spaces that they never knew existed, to tell them these stories and make them look at architecture in new ways is uh, really um, I think it impacts them on a on a really deep level. Well, I can say I tried to get in on the virtual holiday stories happy hour. Um, there were a couple different slots that I was like, oh, I should do that one. Oh, sold out. Oh, I should, oh sold out. So I know it's selling fast. Um, uh, ChicagoDetours.com seems like the best place to go to uh, for people to get in their their reservation. Um, you know, are you thinking about adding more days or more uh, more slots uh, for the tour, or are you uh, it, pretty it set? Looks, it looks like we'll probably have to. Um, it's really spreading like wildfire. What an awesome experience it is to do with your friends and family from afar, especially now that the cases are spiking. Um, we did on Wednesday. We did a private event for a family and it was just such a blast we've got a lot of um families that are booking it just for them um as a private uh experience but they can also just you know you could invite a few family members and come on the on the public experience um it's really uh it's really a blast um and a, and a very unique way to be able to connect with people you care about during the holidays while uh it's not the safest to be with them or also just simply i mean we all have family that are scattered about that we don't just logistically ever get to spend time with so um I know I'm personally excited. I've got um, some cousins uh, who I haven't spent the holidays with in a long time who I've invited to come on our virtual holiday stories happy hour. And um, so, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be fun.
It sounds like a nice way to reach out to to friends and family uh, across the country. So that's that's super cool. Um, Amanda Scatiz, uh, Chicago Detours. Thank you not only for uh, being here today, but for making uh, Chicago history even more enjoyable for people. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me and giving me the opportunity to share this with more people. Absolutely. Well, stay safe, and I'm sure I'll see you again. Great. Uh, it sounds wonderful. Thanks. Thank you.